Hi everybody, it's Adam with heartvalvesurgery.com and we are answering your questions in our Ask Adam Anything series. Today I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Justin Schaefer. Dr. Schaefer, are you there? Hey, thanks for having me, Adam. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. And for our folks out there, uh, Dr. Schaefer, obviously you've helped a lot of folks in our community, whether it's Jerry Sams or Thomas Barton or Pamela Hogue. I know you've done now I, if I understand it, about 3,000 heart procedures, is that correct? Yeah, that's about right, give or take, Adam. Great, well, thanks for all the great work you're doing. You are at Baylor, Scott & White, the Heart Hospital Plano in Plano, Texas, is right next door to Dallas. And, and Dr. Schaefer, we've, we've got a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, two are about sternal wires. Before we get to uh, Kelly and Bob's questions, I just have a really quick question for you. Heart valve surgery is a very unique part of cardiac surgery. What was it about valve therapy, replacement and repairs that really excited you to be create this as one of your specialties? Yeah, thanks, Adam. That's a good question. Um, you know, over the past 20 years, we've really seen a technological revolution in terms of the way that we treat valve disease, both from the terms of what we do from a surgical perspective going from a more traditional sternotomy to more less invasive mini thoracotomies or robotic approaches, as well as from more transcatheter approaches. It used to be that we could only fix uh, coronary artery diseases with stents from a uh, artery in the groin or the wrist, but now we've developed technology to be able to fix uh, a valve in the heart uh, by getting there from an artery in the groin. Um, and that's only improving. Um, and the next 10 to 20 years, we'll see a complete revolution in terms of the way that we treat patients with valvular heart disease. Yeah, it's um, no doubt, no doubt it's an exciting time. And just real quick, Dr. Schaefer, do you focus on one particular valve or do you address all the valves in your practice? Yeah, good question. I, I, I treat all valves, although I would say that about half of my practice is related to uh, valves in the aortic position or its related structures like the ascending aorta or aortic arch. So this includes things like tavers or transcatheter aortic valve replacements, surgical valve replacements in people who don't qualify for a taver because they need a mechanical valve or their valve anatomy is not favorable for a taver. We do those through an upper mini sternotomy. Um, and then things like aortic dissections or aortic aneurysms, uh, valve sparing aortic root replacements or even the Ross procedure. Um, we do some mitral procedures from the more minimally invasive things, and then obviously um, there's also the regular bypass surgeries like the traditional coronary artery bypass grafting and also robotic single vessel approaches where we come in from the left side. Got it. Now, obviously, we've got questions from Kelly and Bob all about sternum wires. Maybe you can real quickly help the patients out there understand at what part of the procedure you use the sternum wires, exactly what they're used for, and the success that you've had with them thus far. Sounds good. After a patient gets a median sternotomy, that's an incision where we uh, uh, cut the skin from about where my top finger is to my bottom finger and divide the breastbone, we have to get that breastbone to heal. And to get it to heal, you need both sides of the breastbone to, to be opposed, to be together. And that's where either a sternal fixation system or a sternal wire comes into place. The sternal wire goes around the breastbone from one side and the other and allows us to twist and uh, the wire together and bring the sternum together. When that sternum's together, like any broken bone, it will mend to, its, to about 90% of its normal tensile strength about eight to 10 weeks after the, the bone has been put together again. At that point, the bone is essentially mended and you don't need the wires anymore, but the wires we typically leave in because uh, we would have to do an incision, another surgery on it to get them out. Got it. It's a great segue. Thanks for the overview. Uh, I've got sternum wires in me right now, and we've got questions all about those sternum wires. Uh, the first one comes from Kelly, Dr. Schaefer, and she asks, can sternum wires cause issues with other medical procedures? I am attempting to get an MRI, and the technician is concerned about the metal in my body. What are your thoughts for Kelly? Yeah, that's a great question, Kelly. And I would say I encounter this question with either a clinic patient or someone in the hospital at least once every couple of weeks, you know. Um, so to the, the short and sweet answer to her question is, it is safe for Kelly to undergo an MRI uh, procedure. Now, unfortunately, the devil's a little bit in the details. And in medicine, we like to make everything as complex as we possibly can. Um, but I think it's important for me to at least talk a little bit about the details so it helps other folks with similar 
questions. Um, in general, the wires that we put in to bring that breastbone together um, are either stainless steel or titanium based. That, that, that goes also for external fixation systems, which we sometimes use for patients. Those metals are not ferromagnetic. Ferromagnetic means something that is highly charged and will have a strong uh, attractive or repulsive force applied to it when it's inside a, a magnetic field. Those are not uh, what we see implanted in hearts uh, at all. Um, most of the metals that we use for either uh, sternal wires or for heart devices are what we call paramagnetic and, and minimally paramagnetic at that, paramagnetic at that, which means something that only has a minimal force that it feels when it's in a magnetic field. Um, and, and so because of that, most of these are essentially safe, but we hate to say, you know, safe for sure if something has not been rigorously tested. And so that leads to the American Heart Association, which has developed guidelines, which it did in 2007, to try and help us figure out what is an MRI safe device, what is a, we're pretty sure it's MRI safe, but we don't have true hard and fast evidence, and what is an MRI unsafe device. And they paired with a website called um, mrisafety.com, www.mrisafety.com, and we'll go over that a little bit later, where you can actually look up whatever device is implanted in you. But it basically, an MRI safe device would be something that has no magnetic items whatsoever. It's non-magnetic, like a plastic something. That can't feel any force in a magnetic field, and so we know from basic physics that is MRI safe. While there are some devices that we put in, in folks uh, from a surgical perspective uh, in the heart that are uh, plastic or, or MRI safe, most of our devices involve some metallic component. And so most of our devices are in this next uh, category, MRI conditional. And that's an item that has never been demonstrated to pose a threat and that has been studied, um, um, but we can't be 100% sure that it would be fine, but we think it's going to be safe and it's been tested in other MRI devices and they haven't had an issue with it. And so as long as you have uh, an MRI technician doing your procedure who is following the guidelines for whatever MRI device they're using, whether it be a 1.5 Tesla device or a three Tesla device, you for all intents and purposes should be safe unless some bizarre catastrophic event occurs. Um, and that, that applies to almost any device that we implant in the heart, whether it's a valve or a stent or these wires. And then lastly, there are MRI unsafe devices, which are the ferromagnetic devices, those devices that feel a very strong magnetic force when they're inside a magnetic field that are MRI unsafe, and very few, if any, cardiac devices um, fall under that category. But the good news is there's a website devoted to this, and you can actually go to www.mrisafety.com to actually look up your specific device to make sure that it's Okay. Dr. Schaefer, I can't thank you enough for taking the time for the very detailed explanation because I get this question often. And so uh, finally, I'm going to have a video, uh, an interview where I can uh, share with our patient community that they can access this and feel better about the next steps in their th therapeutic pro process. So thank you so much. Let's shift now to Bob's question. And this is another question that I get asked all the time. Bob asks, it's one year after surgery. I still have pain in my chest. It hurts constantly. I want to have the wires taken out. Is that possible? If so, what's involved? Another good question, Bob. I would say probably once a year or once every other year, I will remove somebody's external wires. So yes, it can be done. Um, and it's a very straightforward procedure. The big question is whether removing the wires will remove someone's sternal pain and that's something that in general we don't know until we do it. I had one old surgeon when I was in training tell me um, that whenever you do uh, surgery for someone who has pain, what you get is pain with a hole in it. So just be careful for you know doing surgery for pain. But I have had a couple of patients who've had a really good outcome when removing the wires. So Dr. Schaefer, what's the process for you to go ahead and remove the sternum wires for a patient? Yeah, unfortunately, the only way to get the wires out is to do another incision. We have two options there. One is to make a small incision over each of the heads of the wires, and the other is just to do an incision along the, uh, the entire old incision. Uh, and through both of those routes, we can then take a sternal, uh, a wire twisting device, untwist the wires, and then take a um, a wire cutter device and cut the base of the wires and then pull those, those wires out. 
And then what we will do is then suture that skin back together with absorbable suture in general, something that would be absorbed by the body so there would be no stitches on the outside. Um, you know, it's, it's usually a, a 10 or 15 minute surgery. You know, you have to stay for four hours in our recovery unit, just waking up from the anesthesia because we would give you in general, general, you know, full general anesthesia with that procedure. And then folks can go home that same day and they'll be a little sore, probably need a little pain medication for a couple of weeks and then should have a full recovery after that. Yeah, well, Dr. Schaefer, I want to thank you on behalf of Kelly, on behalf of Bob, and behalf of all the patients in our community that you've been helping that you've helped in the past and you are going to help in the future. We're going to go ahead and put up your contact information. So if anybody would like to schedule an appointment with Dr. Schaefer, you can call his office. And I really hope uh, everything continues to go great for you down in uh, Plano, Dr. Schaefer. And thanks for, for being with us today. Pleasure talking to you, Adam. And thanks for having me. All right. Take care, Dr. Schaefer. Bye-bye. Yeah.